Well, this morning we continue with our series in Galatians, and we pick things up back at Galatians chapter 5, and the reading today comes from chapter 5, verses 1 to 14. So now let us hear the word of the Lord. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Here ends the reading. May God bless his word to us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the gift of your word. We thank you that as, the, as we live in this world, as we seek to grow in knowledge, that you have revealed truth to us. The most important truth of all, the revelation of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the hope that we have in him alone. And so God, we pray that you would show us that truth, reveal that truth to our hearts today. Show us who Jesus is. And I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, freedom is a wonderful gift, but it's not always one we receive all at once. We experience freedom to varying degrees over our lives. We're not really born free. We're born into families where we're not in charge and we don't have a say in anything and we have to follow rules that we didn't create. Freedom is something that we gain more and more of as we grow up. Did anyone experience life that way? Yeah. Rules we have when we're young tend to be relaxed more and more as we get older. I see this in how my wife and I relate to our children. The older they get, the more comfortable we are with giving them more freedom. When they were really young, they could play outside, but only with our supervision. You never know when a a little child will put a little leaf or something in their mouth. I remember finding a leaf in my daughter's mouth, just like, how did it get there? You know, she's in the middle of a blanket, and now there's a leaf in your mouth. I don't know how it happens, but as time goes on, When they were young, they could play outside. But as they got a little older, they could play on their own, but in the backyard where we could see them through the kitchen window. And of course, the gates to the backyard would be latched closed. So of course, they couldn't, even if they went out of sight, they would never get away and wander off. And now they've reached an age when it's not even worrisome for us to let them play beyond the backyard in our neighborhood or in the school field behind the house. Uh, They can really go wherever they want as long as they're within earshot and we know they're outside. I'm sure you can relate uh, to this experience in your own life. When you were younger, you had lots of rules, but as you got older, the rules relaxed and you gained more and more freedom. You go from having what you eat, what you wear, and when you go to bed, all decided for you, to having the freedom to choose all those things on your own. If only your parents could see you now choosing to go to bed earlier than 8 o'clock, right? (laughs) 
But at some point we grow up and we, we move out and we make all those decisions on our own. Do you, do you remember those times when your bedtime got a little later and a little later and eventually, you know, no one is telling you to go to bed at all. And so you just, you know, stay up all night. And then you'd learn your lesson. <laughs> See, we make decisions. We, we, when we're really young, we don't have a lot of freedom, do we? We don't have much freedom at all when you think about it. I can still remember when my daughter was little, but starting to crawl around. And so, you know, she was exploring. So we had to put up those little baby gates, you know. So we put her in a room. And I put a, I put a metal baby gate across the doorway because she wasn't one of those babies who just sat still. Now she's a crawling baby, which is a handful. So we put that up. It was for safety, but it did confine her to one room. And I remember when I put it in there, she crawled over to that gate and grabbed the bars and kind of saw how solid they were. She, she grabbed onto those. Now, was she free? No. If anything, she looked like a little prisoner in there, right? Especially when she took her toy teacup and rattled it on the bars from time to time. <laughs> Okay, maybe she didn't go that far. Okay. But she wasn't free as a baby. We're not free when we're really little. We're not free. That's something we gain more and more of as we grow up. Well, the same can be said for the people of God. You see, God gave Abraham a covenant of promise, but then he gave Israel, his descendants, a covenant of law. And when Christ came in the fullness of time, God gave freedom in Christ. It's not that the law was bad, it's just that it wasn't the ultimate goal. The rules and laws served a purpose, like a guardian, like a babysitter, pointing out, hey, you're not perfect. You know, this whole promise and grace thing, you're going to need that, because you're not keeping all the laws, you're not following all the rules. It was something to guide the people over time, but they ultimately all pointed to our human weakness and our need for a Savior. So when the Savior finally came, so did freedom. It wasn't so important that the that covenant of the law was maintained. There was freedom in Christ. Galatians 5.1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Jesus has set you free. But that's not enough that he's just done that. He wants you to keep that freedom and make something out of that freedom. We don't just say, hey, I've got there's all this independence. I can eat what I want, wear what I want, go to bed when I want, and I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. No, freedom is an opportunity. It's an opportunity. And Jesus wants you to make something of that freedom. Jesus sets us free from so many things. He sets us free from slavery to sin, from superstition. He sets us free from the power of blind cultural conformity. When people follow the crowd and do what others do and think what others think just because that's what people are doing or what, that's what people are thinking. Well, we don't have to do that. We're not slaves to that. We're free in Christ. But here's the thing. Freedom is an opportunity. We're meant to do something with it. So make the most of your freedom. Make the most of your freedom. And Paul's going to give us one thing to do to make us make the most of our freedom. And we'll come to that near the end. But this is the calling that we find for us here in Galatians 5 to make the most of our freedom. In Christ, if Christ set us free, how do we make the most of our freedom that we enjoy in Christ? Well, it says, for freedom Christ has set us free. So the first thing to make the most of your freedom is not to give it up. Don't give up that freedom. He set you free for a reason. Instead, stick with it. He says, stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. If you're free from one thing, you don't find slavery somewhere else. You want to retain the freedom that Christ gave you. And these Galatians were trying to go back into the covenant of the law and find all these rules and regulations to follow. And that's where they were going back into slavery using the metaphor. Of course, last week you might remember the metaphor of Hagar and, and Sarah. But that's where the, their problem was. And then he says this. Look, I, Paul, I'm telling you this. I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. 
It's a dichotomy. You can take this path or that path. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obligated to keep the whole law. You can't just pick and choose. If you're going down this path of justification through the law, you've got to keep the whole thing. He says, you can't go through that door. You can't set out on that path. Now this brings up a, a question about Paul. What was his real stance on the law? Right here, it, it looks like he's saying, don't ever follow any of the rules or you're in trouble. But really, his stance is a bit more complicated. See, on the one hand, he didn't want Gentiles to start following the law as an alternative path to justification, as an alternative to Christ. But on the other hand, he, he wasn't against Jewish people keeping Jewish traditions or even people being circumcised or, or following the rules as they had always done. He didn't say Jews had to stop. You know, this was a very fine line to walk, though. And that's why we see interesting passages throughout Scripture. In Acts 21, verse 20, the disciples say to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews, those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. And then in verse 21, And they have been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. Now you can see how someone could take something in Galatians and take it that way and say, Oh, he's saying nobody get circumcised ever again, don't follow any of those laws, don't follow any of those rules, or it's the wrong path. But they continued. These people said, Paul, this is your, your reputation. And they say, what then is to be done? These people will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men, purify yourselves along with them, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. Now this is interesting. What is Paul going to do? Does he defy the law at every turn? Or does he actually follow the law? Well, verse 26 then says that Paul did it. Then Paul took them in. And the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. So he actually did follow the rules. He followed the law. He, he, he kept the ritual. In fact, back in chapter 16, it even says this. Paul, who said, don't receive circumcision. What does it say in 16? Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was Greek. In other words, Timothy was half Jewish, half non-Jewish. But Paul was saying circumcision's okay then, in that circumstance. So what was his overall position? Well, his stance was really to be all things to all men. Right? His job was not to say that anything was particularly wrong with the law. What was wrong was using it as an alternative to Christ. This was his real stance, if you really want to narrow it down to one or two sentences, right? Well, this is 1 Corinthians 9. He says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. So in other words, he would go through the formal rituals, he'd follow the, the protocols as necessary, if it would help him reach people. But he was not under obligation to do so. He could do it, but he didn't have to. He was doing it just for their sake. And so he says, For those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. He just accommodated himself to reach people. Because the priority was the gospel. It wasn't following all these rituals or rules. They were not bad in and of themselves. See, circumcision was not the problem. 
following the law wasn't the problem. It was misusing the law as a means to be justified before God. That was the problem. That's it. And I think he clarifies this himself in Galatians when carefully read. He says, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but faith working through love. And there he clarifies, circumcision, uncircumcision, that's not the point. That's not the point. You see... What matters is faith working through love. Not faith plus works of love, right? Circumcision's not the problem. It's what it represented in taking a non-Christian path to redemption. So for, in that context, the Galatians were thinking, oh, if I enter into this covenant through circumcision, then I will justify myself before God by being in that covenant. That will solve the problem. And Paul's saying, no, don't receive circumcision. Don't go down that path. But what he does say instead, he's basically saying, if you're trying to be justified by the law, instead of by grace through faith in Christ, then you've cut yourself off from Christ. You've chosen an alternative to him. You're not combining something with him. You're choosing something else. Now, some might ask, since Paul is speaking about circumcision, is it only the ceremonial law of the Old Testament? that he says doesn't justify us before God. In other words, is there still room to say that we're justified not by the ceremonial law, but by keeping the moral law, the other laws of God? And the answer is no. Paul doesn't say you're justified by faith plus works. He says, for through the Spirit by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. And then he says, what matters is faith working through love. Not faith plus works of love. Faith working through love. The faith is what's doing the working here. So there are people that sometimes wonder, well, aren't we, don't we have to combine our works with the faith to be justified by God? Isn't it us who justify ourselves? The answer is no. That's not what Paul is saying. His focus is on the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. That's true. But it's not any law and obedience to any law that's going to get us right with God. It's not following any rules that's going to make it up to God for our sins. You see, Jesus is the Savior. He did all the work. As God the Son, he became human and obeyed the whole law perfectly, something that no human had ever done before or has done since. And since he did that, the reason why he did that was so that he could then offer his life for us on the cross as the perfect high priest offering the perfect sacrifice for sins. And by faith, only faith in him, we are made right with God. We're forgiven of our sins and we have the hope of righteousness and eternal life in his presence. See, that's the path of promise. The way of grace. But for whatever reason, churches go astray. They forget why they exist and what Christ has called us to. We all get distracted or we take truth for granted. We don't like hearing the same thing week after week. We get bored. We want to hear new things. We want something new to explore. And so it's easy to jump on the next big trend. Other churches are doing this. Well, I'll do that. Oh, the culture's going that way. Well, I'll go that way. Whatever's new and exciting, that's what I want to explore. And it's sad to see that happen. You see, the Galatians were, were falling for a wrong view of Christianity. And that was sad for Paul. It was sad but he still holds out hope for that church. He says it, that you were running so well, you know, who got you off track, who hindered you from obeying the truth. He says, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. This is not coming from Christ. 
He points out a little leaven leavens the whole lump. All it takes is a little bit in a, of a problem and it mixes throughout and it spreads. But he says, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who's troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. Now Paul has strong words for that person who's leading the church astray. Because it's such a terrible thing that he was not there. you know. But somebody was leading those people down the wrong path. And you know, people cause problems for the church. That's as true today as it was 2,000 years ago. But do you know what churches do about it? Well, I think one of the greatest failures of the Western church is that it's practically given up on discipline for false teaching. Yeah, if you commit a crime, yeah, you'll be brought under discipline and they'll deal with that. If you've hurt somebody, then you've got somebody complaining about that. But if it's false teaching, people just say, well, it's okay. You can believe and teach whatever you want. And surrounding churches will just say, oh, well, that's fine. Denominations will say that's okay. And that's just a starting point, but that's how it is. Even if the teaching is wrong, we won't interfere. We want to be kind and gracious and loving, and so we let things slide. And there can be sincere Christians who believe the truth, but when the falsehood is taught, they just say, okay, that's all right, I can live with that. And that's just the first step. That just opens the door to saying, well, a little leaven is okay, so a lot of leaven throughout the whole lump is okay too. And that is the gateway to churches then teaching the opposite of what Christianity is. And this is the mess that Paul's dealing with in Galatia. The problem with this really is that the stakes are so high. Now people today can go to all sorts of churches on a Sunday morning and not hear the gospel and not receive the offer of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. You're not going to hear it most, in most churches. I hope that's not true, but I think it's most. And, and, and it's not just that it isn't always mentioned, it's that the message has been replaced with a completely different message. There are sermons in all, church, all the churches everywhere, but what is the message? Is the message actually Christ or is it something different? Well, I think we're in a sad situation. And so Paul's pointing out that they shouldn't get off track and start following an alternative path to redemption. One, especially that this, that this form of slavery. Don't do that. Christ has made you free. But then what are we supposed to do with that freedom? Well, here's the thing. Freedom is an opportunity. Freedom's an opportunity. That's almost essentially what it is. The opportunity to do something or something else. You're not really bound to doing only one thing. So you have opportunities and freedom. This is what he said. He says this, actually, that's a little later. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. Don't use it in the wrong way. You've got freedom, but use it well. Do you remember that? As you get older, you get to make more and more choices. But those choices aren't always the right ones. Those choices can be good or bad. You know, when you're younger, parents choose what you eat, what you wear, when you go to bed. And for children, usually they make the best choices. Most of us as children don't have a good sense of what we should eat, what we should wear, or what time we should go to bed. You get older, you finally move out, you can choose what you eat, what you wear, when you go to bed. But do you remember making some bad choices? You had a bad diet. Anybody see young people? You know, you know, I was a young bachelor. I don't know how to cook two things, right? I know toast and noodles. Do you think my diet was really good? Get out on my own. Cafeteria food's not going to help me either on that front. Bad bedtimes, that was one thing that was the worst for me. I got out on my own and I was like, no bedtime? Great. And then I started having classes in the afternoon and no morning class. I didn't even have to go to bed on time. So I just went to bed later and later and later. And I remember the time I got up, got some coffee, looked out the window and I was just across from a school and I saw the school buses out there. I was like, oh, the kids are there. 
But then I looked at the clock. I was like, no, those are the buses to pick the kids up to take them home. I was like, oh, man, I, I'm really, really off kilter. We don't always eat the best things. We don't choose the best bedtimes at first, do we? We don't make the most of our freedom. And in fashion, I don't know. Young people don't always have very good fashion either, do they? But we can use through that freedom, not to make mistakes, but actually to improve our lives. We can make really good choices. And in fact, we can prove ourselves and take such good care of ourselves that we're actually able to help others too. We can take care and help others. When we take good care of ourselves. When you're well rested, well fed, you're in good shape, you can can really help people. You see, Paul takes their longing for the law and points out that there's still a law you can follow. You really want to follow the law. Well, if you enter into this path, you've got to follow the whole law. But he says, you want a law? Well, I'll give you a law. If you keep this, you keep the whole law. Just one thing. Just do it with one law. Do you know what that law is? He said this. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You want to spend all your time following rules and rituals? Well, forget about it. You can spend your whole life finding all the different ways to fulfill that one law, can't you? I could do sermon after sermon on how to love your neighbor as yourself. So make the most of your freedom in Christ. Use your freedom to serve and love others. And do this, not trusting in yourself, but trusting in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit forever. Amen. I hope and Jesus blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend. On Jesus' name, on Christ the Solid Rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails, His lovely face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every eye and stormy gale. My anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covered and his blood support me in the whelming flood. now go and serve the Lord let us love and care for one another and let us go with God's blessing may the love of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all amen